Where did you meet him? In, in China. Ghana. In China? Yes, yeah, so we were studying in China where we met. Okay. And the thing is, the day I met him, like I met him tonight, and the next day they were leaving to go to a different um, city. So, um, Ondero, please can you tell me about yourself? Okay, so hi, my name is Zendero Oganga. I'm a Kenyan, I'm a journalist, I'm a YouTuber, and in another life maybe I would be a singer and a poet. So I am Kenyan by birth and born and bred in Kenya. Nairobi is the capital, but I'm originally from the lakeside. So yeah, we are the- Where, where is the lakeside? The lakeside is like a region in Kenya. Mm. We love it there, cool, unlike Ghana, very cool temperature fast-paced people the food doesn't have a lot of pepper so mm. <laughs> yeah Kenyan is known for unique strength and yes. athletics right oh yeah oh my god so the funny thing is when people meet me and I tell them I'm Kenyan the next thing they ask me is can you run <laughs> and I'm like what's the probability that in a country of 40 million everybody runs mm. so there's a particular tribe in Kenya that runs not everybody not runs everybody that yes runs. so and athletes when you see them they look like athletes I, I don't look like an athlete what, what, I like what part of Kenyan Kenyan tribe runs maybe. okay so they come mostly they come from Rift Valley Okay. Central and maybe Kisi, but I would say it's the Highlands. The Highlands. Yes. What did you do in Kenya before moving to Ghana? Okay, so I'm a journalist by profession. I went to school to study to be a journalist. So I was practicing as a journalist. I graduated school, got my first job as a news reporter and anchor. And then I moved after I think two years of working at Brand Plus TV. I moved to Metropole TV as a senior reporter and news anchor. And that's where I worked for about two years again before I moved to Ghana. I'm a business journalist actually, so we are the guys that crunch the numbers. People think it's boring, but I think it's very interesting and very important. Oh, okay. What caught your attention about Ghana? I think I was at a place in my life where I needed to slow things down. Mm -hmm. um, having grown up in Nairobi and Kenya, it was like over 20 years of constant chase. So there's this thing that I was suffering from and I, I would say many young people and Kenyans suffer from, it's called destination addiction, where you're going through primary school and your parents tell you, you must get 400 marks so that you get to a good school. Okay. So you hustle, you get those marks, you're not playing, you're not, like, you're not even sleeping, you're, you're being woken up so early. You get the 400 marks, you go to high school. When you go to high school, you're being pestered to get good grades to go to uni. Mm. And so you work so hard, you go to uni. When you're in uni, you can't enjoy uni because they're like, work hard so you can get a job. <laughs> when you get your first job, when you graduate, you're not even given space. They're like, when are you starting your first job? When are you getting your first job? You get your first job, people are like, oh, yeah, yeah. You need to get a better job. You're better than mm -hmm. this. So you're constantly chasing. And before you know it, life has slipped away from you. You'll never be 17 again. Mm -hmm. You'll never be 21 mm -hmm. again. You'll never... All these experiences get away from you and unfortunately because we're human it weighs down on our spirit and I think I was just ready to step away from the chaos and slow my life down you forgot to add a part that when you are a lady they, they pressure you to get married oh. and then when are you going to have kids yes and oh my all god that. yes and even if you're a guy when are you getting a car when are you getting exactly. a house when are you exactly. marrying exactly. and all these negative pressures that turn things that should have been good experiences into things that you're just checking off the box without living through them. Mm. Yeah. How long have you been in Ghana? Oh, so I came to Ghana in July of 2021 mm -hmm. and it was very strategic because June, July, August, September is very cold in Kenya. Okay. So I just knew in March. So in March, I got COVID. You got After, COVID? Yes, in March of 2021. And I'd worked in a newsroom for a whole year I had avoided getting COVID. I was always wearing two masks, sanitizing, doing everything <laughs> because I have, I'm not, I don't have very good health. Mm. And so I thought I had gotten away with it. I was like, ah, the pandemic is almost over. I mm. didn't get it. And then one Thursday evening, I was beginning to feel so sick. And I went to the hospital, I ran tests, everything came out negative. So the doctor said, just sleep, rest, relax. Monday, I go to work. I used to host a show from 11 to 12 p.m. But when I'm going on air, I realize that I can't breathe. Oh. 
And so you're in denial. You know you're in denial. It can't be COVID. It can't be COVID. And because you're a journalist, you're at the forefront. You're covering COVID. You see people die. You see people suffocate. You you know the horrors of the disease. Exactly. So you're in denial. So I go, I put sanitizer, I smell. I can smell it. I try eating something, I can taste it. Mm. I'm like, no, it's not COVID. <laughs> I have taste, I have smell. But every time I try talking or breathing, it's like I'm choking. The air wasn't getting right through to my lungs. I finished the show gasping for air and that's also how you know that i really needed to step away because i said i'm not feeling well and i was asked who's gonna host your show so i had to go choke on air finish the show and i just knew that i am sick i i don't want to admit it but i'm sick i called my sister she works in the medical field and i said i can't breathe and i'm scared and my sister said don't be scared come let's test you i went i that evening i don't think i was able to get tested because also there weren't enough kits, but they gave me an injection to reduce the inflammation in my lungs, and I went home. And I was so scared that night. It was a Monday, and because everybody knew I had COVID besides me, everybody knew it was COVID, I was alone. So you can imagine you're used to eating with your family, mm -hmm. hanging out with mm -hmm. them, watching mm -hmm. TV with them, and then everybody's in their rooms, and you're alone. You are in isolation. Yes. And it's not, it's not isolation, isolation. You know it's isolation, but nobody's telling you that. And my dad was on the other side. It was about 12 in the night, and he was like, are you okay? And that's when I knew, oh my God, this is serious. Like, I could die, because my parents are worried. I can't breathe, and my life began flashing right in front of my eyes. And I asked myself, if you die now, are you happy with the life that you've lived? Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I said to myself, what a waste of my life. I had everything that people thought I should have but I felt like I had wasted my life and I said if I die but if I leave I'm gonna change everything I'm gonna quit my job I'm gonna pack my bags and I'm gonna go to Ghana that's it and I did not die and uh, I spent the rest of March in isolation April I quit my job wow that yeah. was a brave 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 move I think when you almost die it's it's such a cliche thing that when they say when you're about to die, your life flashes right in front of mm -hmm. your eyes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of those stories of someone who's a heavy drunkard and then they got into an accident, they almost died, and then exactly. they quit alcohol, exactly. they give their exactly. life to Christ? Exactly. It's the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. Thank did you, you. Did you have like some saved capital already when you decided to quit your job? Or mm -hmm. like okay, so that's a very good question because many people do not understand the financial investment that it takes to move. It's, it's very capital intensive. Lucky for me, and lucky is, is a stretch. I am a very financially, or I try, I strive to become a financially disciplined person. So I had saved a, a decent amount of money. I had some investments. So before moving, actually right before I got COVID, my financial advisor, I had a, at least $10,000 in the bank outside of my savings, mm. outside of my investment. It was just money that the previous year I had worked and saved aggressively. And so we had just had the annual review and we were like, you're going to put this money here, you're going to put this money here, you're going to put this money here. And then I got COVID and I was like, okay, it's not going to work. So I had to look for another person. She's both a financial and life coach. And we had to sit down and say, how are you going to move? We did several sessions. I think she charged me $400 and we did several sessions. She said, I need you to tell me how much your air ticket is going to cost where you're gonna live, how much it will cost, how much it will cost to furnish your house, how much you're going to be spending monthly, mm -hmm. how much you're gonna need before you become stable, when you're likely to be stable. I and so we, we drew a plan. Okay. And so it was like every month, this is the amount of money that you can spend and you can't go above it. And I always tell people as a joke that I couldn't afford a seat in my house when I came to Ghana. Not that I didn't have money, but because it wasn't in the budget and I had to be very disciplined. Because when I came here, prices of things had like had begun going up so it was outside of the budget that we had worked with the mistake that i made i budgeted with things with the kenyan like if it costs say 500 cds in kenya i budget with that then i come here i find it's 700 or a thousand mm. so it means i cannot buy it and so it took financial discipline to be able to do it but it's because i also had the means to be able to do it i wish i had the confidence that you have to make such a decision oh, in, in retrospect let me tell you in retrospect sometimes it's it's like a foolish decision oh. because um if if i hadn't gotten COVID, mm -hmm. i wouldn't have come because sometimes okay. you just need that nudge to to make you go to the next step it's it's scary 
to be honest with you, it's a very scary decision and you'll keep second guessing yourself. There are days that I've cried in the house and asked myself, why? Why did you move? The days that you go broke, the days that you're not making as much money as you'd like to, you're not where you'd like to, you miss your family, you miss food, you miss speaking your local language. But there are days you go to the beach and it's just so peaceful. Mm. Yeah. Did you notice any similarities when you arrived in Ghana? Hmm. <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are quite very different people, to be honest with you. Wow. Yeah, because even for food, like here, like if you're preparing soups, Mm -hmm. You start like at 2 p.m., 3 p.m. because it takes time. Exactly. And there are a variety of soups and the soups are very rich with flavor, you know. Mm -hmm. Light soup, palm nut soup, mm -hmm. groundnut soup, you know. Mm -hmm. In Kenya, we don't have that. <laughs> well, it's fast food, pak, pak, pak. You are it's, done. it's not necessarily fast, but cooking it is very easy. Okay. So let me tell okay. you, my husband and I, he can now cook majority like 70 or 80 percent of kenyan dishes wow. i still can't make one Ghanaian dish <laughs> because of the effort and the time and the love that goes into it the spices that you need to even like just make it you know and the food is different because here until i came here then i realized beans you can eat beans and meat mm. you can eat like fish and meat you can eat chicken and meat. In Kenya, we don't like mix them. Mix them yeah. Like you guys here, like the egg, like boiled egg. Now I love it. Like I buy it with everything. But in Nairobi, we don't eat it with food. Like we eat it as a snack, okay. not necessarily like with a meal. So it was very different. It is very, very different, but a good kind of different. I love the soups here. So there was this joke that West Africans would always come to Kenya and say our food is tasteless. Oh. And we would fight them and they'd be like, salt is not flavor. And we were like, but when you come here and you, you understand the variety of food, you have banku, you have fufu, exactly. wache, jolof, kontomre. There's so many things that you can try. So mm -hmm. the profile and the depth of flavor is vast here as compared to Kenya. I would say that people are kinder and nicer. You know, it's so sad that you could be. And it, it, I know that... My people will not be happy me saying this, but people don't know their neighbors. People don't know their neighbors. You can die in your house. The other day somebody died in their house. They were fighting with their spouse. People only came... Are you came speaking of Ghana or Kenya? Kenya. Okay. Pe somebody died because they were fighting with their spouse and people did not come to help despite the fact that this person was asking for help until they saw blood going down the staircase. Wow. By the time they came, it was too late. The guy was in the ICU for two days and then died. He had, he had bled, like his organs had shed, and it's because people are closed off, you know, people don't greet their neighbors. Here, your neighbors care. Like when I came, I used to find it very invasive because people keep greeting you, and I'm like, exactly. what? Exactly. What is it? Leave exactly. me. Because I had carried so much anger in me, and I'm like, what is it? What do you want from me? Or people asking you, where are you going? I'm like, w w excuse me? What's your business? But then you realize that people care. Exactly. In case somebody comes looking for you, they'd be like, oh, she's gone to Accra, she'll come back. Or in case maybe you left your clothes on the line, they know that you'll not be back, they'll take them out for you. You know, there was some day I was in the bathroom showering. Somebody knocked on my door. I said, who is it? They said, please come, please come. I ignored. Guess what? Three seconds later, rain was pouring and my clothes <laughs> were outside. But do you know the funny thing? they had taken out my clothes for me. Wow. So I go out looking for who has my clothes and they were like, I knocked, you did not open. And I was like, I was in the bathroom and they were like, oh yeah, I figured out probably you were taking a shower. Really, does that happen in Nairobi? Everybody just minds their business. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but what's the essence of life without a sense of community? That's true, that's true. So the, the differences are very glaring, mm. you know? Similarities, we're both Africans. Exactly. <laughs> we're exactly. both Africans. We're both developing countries. The challenges are the same, you know? Challenges with youth and unemployment, challenges with leadership, challenges with politics, challenges with infrastructure, challenges with young people wanting to leave. Wanting to leave yes, the country. Yes, because okay. people now, how are you 23, 24, 25, 26, 27? You haven't gotten a job yet you have a degree you're wasting away you know you want to also have a, a decent shot at life you know so these are normal challenges challenges with mental health you know i don't think it's spoken a lot about here but mm. it, it really is a challenge it's the same thing is happening in kenya recently um one of our um thespians she's an actress her name is nice one jerry is it nice N what's her name she posted yes i think it's nice 
she posted a tweet that one of her students who was 21 mm -hmm. had died by suicide so when we were growing up you would hear so and so's father committed suicide so and so's mother co and it was taboo but now the people committing suicide are younger people so you can imagine in in a span of 10 to 20 years the people committing suicide have gone from 40 or 60 to 21 17 13 we have kids as young as 7 8 9 10 committing suicide in primary school so the challenge which was not very common in africa yeah I, I think maybe we weren't talking about it it was okay. always taboo because i know where i come from if you commit suicide there are certain burial rites that they have to commit on you to perform on you they have to wash you with certain herbs you can't be buried during the day you're buried at night and all these things so it was very hush hush but i think now we're just talking about it a little bit more so the challenges are the same so similarly we are all africans yes and then the difference is the food mm -hmm. and uh, hospitality the hospitality yes that's a difference you mentioned that you you are married you, you talked about your husband yes did you marry in Kenya or you married in Ghana? Here, here in Ghana. You married in Ghana? Yeah. How did it happen? Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> How did it happen? Um, I think we've always known that, I, I, I don't, when I say we, I think I'm not being objective. So for me, the funny thing is marriage was never my thing. Okay. Settling down was never my thing. Even relationships, by the time my husband was meeting me, I was single for four years wow. and I was okay. My plan was I'm going to get to 30, freeze my eggs, at 35 have my child and just live my life and that is if i decide to even have the child mm. the other plan was maybe work make money travel the world i have nieces and nephews that i really love and in africa your sister's children are technically your children, children right <laughs> yeah, so I, my life was okay until i met this gorgeous Ghanaian man and even the relationship that we had where did you meet him in, in china Ghana. in china yes yeah, so we were studying in china where we met okay and the thing is, the day I met him, like I met him tonight, and the next day they were leaving to go to a different um, city. So we met in Beijing, and then he left the next day. I think they were going to another city. And even for me, I think I stayed in Beijing for just a couple of days. Then I began traveling around China. Mm. So we didn't talk. We didn't get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, right? And so when he came back to Ghana, I was still in China. But the time zones were very different. So when I'm, I'm waking up, he's going to bed. When I'm going to bed, he's, he's waking, waking up. up. Now the problem is I used to work out. I used to go to the gym mm -hmm. because of where I used to stay. So I wake up, I want to go to the gym, but he's trying to chat and talk. And I'm like, back off, <laughs> back off. But it's also because sometimes you don't know what healthy love exactly. is. Healthy love is somebody wants to know how you are, communicate, talk to you. They enjoy spending time with you. But I didn't know all these things. I was just like, why is this guy always texting me? And so we just continued talking. And then I went back to Nairobi. We just kept talking. And then I, anxiety began creeping in. And I was like, oh my God, what if, what if, what if? And um, my former boss, who was also a friend, said, take it one day at a time. Does it feel good today? Period. That's all that matters. What are you worrying about tomorrow? How do you even know you'll be alive tomorrow? We kept talking, visiting each other once in a while, here and there. And then one day, I was from work. I just remember. I was smiling to myself. I was thinking about him and smiling. And I went and asked her, how should it feel? How should it feel being in love? She asked, how do you feel? I said, I feel easy. It feels peaceful. It feels very serene. Is that love? And she said, what were you expecting to feel? I was like, butterflies, you know. And she's like, uh-uh. What you're feeling is actually love. Because you're beginning to let go and just be. And yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm in trouble. I, I really like this boy. So what's going to happen? Then we were just like being in a relationship, enjoying it. And honestly, I did not. And I know this sounds weird because people are always like, when you get in a relationship, you want to think about the end goal. Mm -hmm. And for many girls, you're, you're looking forward to your engagement. You're looking forward to your wedding. You're looking forward to all these things. I never thought about them. I was just like, I like what we have. And, and that's it. I like being with you. And that's it. There was never a goal, actually, until earlier this year when one day he just said, you know what, I really want to get married. And I asked why. 
<laughs> and he said was it specific that he really wants to get married to you or he he was saying it generally excuse me how do you date someone and then you come <laughs> hey hey your body mon hey how oh, hey hey i love i love being a kenyan mm -hmm. so there was no way i again marriage was not my thing mm -hmm. so the, i i don't think that i would have married him for citizenship mm -hmm. you get cuz i love being He's a kenyan you know so when he asked that i was like why do you want to get married i mean i like what we have why do you want to introduce new dynamics to it and he quoted the bible actually my my husband just like many Ghanaians, is a very spiritual person grew up in the church he loves the church that's like his safe place and that i love that about him i love that he loves god i love his unwavering faith in god and so he said um you know, when you marry, you obtain favor from the... What's the Bible verse? Quote it. I don't know. I don't hey, know. <laughs> hey, are you going to hear We are revoking, know, we are revoking your Ghana card. But I remember, I remember, I remember Paul said, said something in First Corinthians, I think chapter 6, uh -huh. verse 7, saying that he would that all men would be like him. Uh -huh. But then because of temptation, everyone should get his own wife. <laughs> I don't know if that's what he could No, that's not the verse. The verse was, you guys tell us in the comment section. Mm -hmm. The verse was, he who marries, who gets a wife, gets a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Oh. Okay. And so I was like, ah, okay, you make sense. But still, I wasn't, it, it wasn't a big deal for me. And I think he understands the kind of person that I am. Allowed me the space and the time to just let it sink in. Mm. And even when it happened, it happened on our own terms. It happened how we wanted. I feel like now many young people are not even able to do it because there's that Instagram and, and Facebook and the consumer culture the has taught us that weddings have to be big and fancy. What's, what's, marriage is the unification of two people. You sign the certificate, you have witness, maybe you get somebody to pray for you. If you can afford to go big, well and good. But I've seen so many people, you go big on your wedding, you're in debt, you don't have a house, you don't have so many things. And so it holds back many people. And it was a conversation between my partner and I and we said, a time will come when we have money and we can afford all these things, but now can we just do it on our own terms? It was very small, intimate, sacred, beautiful, and just the way we would have wanted it to Did be. you have any family barriers, whether on your side or your side? Hey, hey, hey. I don't think so because the funny thing is the first date, my husband took me home to his mom. Oh. The first date. That was a very first Yes, date. first date. I remember I was in Ghana and he said, he came to see me at my house. That was the first time he asked me. I said, will you come tomorrow to church? Yeah. I went to church. After church, he took me home to his mom to eat fufu. And it was my first time <laughs> eating fufu. So I didn't know how fufu is eaten. So in Kenya, we have ugali, which is almost like banku, but not sour, mm. or akple, right? And we have vegetables, you might say, maybe kontomri, right? So you eat it separately. And even if there's stew, you also put the stew separately. Mm. So I get home. Uh, the mom asks, what do you want? As in nothing. My husband no, says, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that, <laughs> that here. It doesn't work like that here. So the mom, the mom is like, can you offer her something? He's like, what do you want? I say, okay, I'll take water. So they give me water. I drink water. Even like a few minutes don't pass. I see hot pots being brought. I'm like, excuse <laughs> me, excuse me. You know that I don't eat at people's houses. He's like, you have to eat. And so what shocked me was, so I see this bowl of soup and then the man just takes the fufu and drops it in there. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and he's like, that's how fufu is eaten. Exactly. And so I see him dipping his fingers and eating and I'm like, ah, where's my plate? Like, where's, why are we eating from the same plate? Why? And so we begin eating, but I'm so uncomfortable and I'm chewing the fufu and they're saying, no, don't chew, just swallow, swallow. <laughs> just swallow. And the mom was there and the mom's friend was there. And um, it was just, it was nice. I don't think I've ever felt any form of hostility. Yeah. Okay, so which one of these questions is more um, important to ask? Is it who do I want to marry or who do I qualify to marry? Let me tell you, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> I've spent the whole interview telling you how marriage was not my thing, how I didn't want You're asking the, like, mm. I do, it's like but a lady asking you have, me. You have, you have the experience, even if it's just a week, I feel you're qualified to give me such, such an advice. So. Kai, I will bring my husband here so that you ask him this question because <laughs> it's the intuitive one, you know? Um, hmm. Who do I marry? 
or who do I qualify to marry? You know, I, I, I really I really don't know. It just depends on you. Mm. It depends on who you are and what you want and how much you're willing to work on yourself, change and compromise, you know. I, you know, you will not get any <laughs> advice from me because me, I'm the type of person and I'm not even lying to you. I'm the type of person who when my friends would come to me with their relationship problems, I'd tell them, leave him. <laughs> like that is my ad I'll call any of my friends right now and ask them if you call on Dero asking her for relationship advice what would she tell you mm, my yeah. advice is sis leave him you know nobody is stressing us in this life <laughs> now miss leave him is living with him but um i i, I don't know <laughs> i'm being very honest i'm not one to pretend to be who i'm not i don't think i've thought about it that deeply i think the universe was just very gracious and God was very gracious and he put in my way somebody who was really good for me and that's just it. Okay. Have you ever felt unwelcomed in any way, any time, any day? Okay, so Ghanaians have been really nice but sometimes I feel like when you speak your truth it makes certain people uncomfortable. Remember, I'm not Ghanaian, I'm a foreigner and my experience will not be the same. So there are things that will frustrate me. Even if you today, you go to America, you'll get a job, land of opportunities, blah, blah, blah. But there are things that will frustrate you. Exactly. And if you talk about them, then people feel like you're ungrateful. Go back to your country. Why? You're hating. I'm like, no, I am just frustrated. And I'm trying to share these experiences so that the next person who's coming is better prepared, you know? The things that I wish I knew. I wish I knew that you need proper housing or you need to know who will get your house because it can be so frustrating. And as a foreigner, where I come from, we don't pay rent in a year. We pay monthly. If mm. you don't know this and you get here and somebody is asking you to pay for a year, it can stress you. It can stress you a lot because now it changes your budget. You know, if you get here and you have to keep paying um, agents every time they see a house it changes your budget if you get here and maybe there's no electricity or Wi-Fi is slow yet you come from a place where these infrastructures work it can frustrate you it doesn't mean that you don't love the place it means that it has its own challenges and you need a little bit of time to adopt and so I found that every time I spoke about the things that were frustrating me I received a lot of hate and I can also understand because this is somebody's home and they're trying to protect the dignity but also we have to find that middle ground of allowing also people to genuinely share their experience so that you know where to improve and also when other foreigners come they know what to expect yeah mm. so except housing what other thing have you felt that it needs to be improved oh so I think it's because you don't know if you don't know is when it frustrates you but when you know then you find a way around it for example housing can frustrate you if you don't know that there are companies with reliable agents or landlords with very reliable agents that you don't have to keep paying and they're honest they'll show you houses that you just genuinely like and in a week or even in a matter of days you can get the house that you like you know there are crooks out there that will show you houses for a whole month so that they can keep getting your 70 exactly. cities but they're good people out there so it, it only frustrates you because you don't know. You might be frustrated that you bought Airtel Tigo and you're in Volta. Yet you don't know that Airtel Tigo is only strong in Accra. If exactly. you go to Volta, get MTN. Exactly. You know? So it's only frustrating when you don't know. It's frustrating when you go take a house in Asylum Down. Beautiful house. But you didn't know that Asylum Down floods during the rainy season. <laughs> so when it rains, then it frustrates you. But if you know that it rains, then you'll get a house that... It's frustrating when you think that houses are 1,500 CD... $1,500, $2,000, but that's because you're in, you're looking in Osu, you're looking in Laboni, you're looking in Cantonment. If you go to Jowulu, if you go to Chad, or if you go to Tema or Yarifa, you'll find houses within your budget. So it's only frustrating when you don't know. If you go to, the, to one hospital, your experience might not be the same. But for a smaller price, if you go to a private hospital, they're going to attend to you in a way that makes you feel safe and seen as a patient. So I feel like people get frustrated because they don't know. But if people don't talk about these frustrations, nobody will know. So if I say I'm frustrated about housing, then you come in knowing that housing can be a headache. Then you start looking for solutions. Then how do I beat this? If also is expensive, then you'll start asking people, where can I live that is still decent but is not expensive? So I feel like all the challenges in Ghana that we sometimes experience is because we don't have 
a hundred percent of information as foreigners coming in because you guys live here exactly. and you survive exactly. but it's because you live here you know you know if the main road has traffic you know how to go you know to pass. so <laughs> you as a foreigner you're stuck in traffic you're crying Accra has traffic no it's because you don't know the other route that that makes a lot of sense have yeah. you had any other issue with customer service in ghana or i'm used to it now i mean let me tell you there was a day we went to a restaurant and Benjamin literally took out a serviette and just began cleaning. And the guy came and was like, no, 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 that's my job. That's why I'm here for you. And I'm like, excuse me? Okay, come through customer service. Because you just get used to it, you know. Um, when I came, it was a rude shock. Because I come from a place where customer service, tourism and hospitality in Kenya is really big. It's one of our drivers of the GDP. So everybody is on top of their game. When I came here, I realized food can take for five minutes. They can bring the wrong drink. It's just small, <laughs> small things. You know, you, you can call and they don't pick. The glass is dirty. The table is dirty. Or they bring, you order chicken, they bring meat and they say, oh, there was no chicken and I've already brought it. I can't take it back. But then you just get to a place where you accept this is where I am. You get to the place and you don't even look at the menu. You ask them, what do what you, you have? have? <laughs> you what know? Do you have? Or... When you want to experience good service, then you save a little so that for 500 or 1,000 CDs, you go to a nice restaurant where you know, you get the quality service. And mm. also important to note that right now, many diasporas are, are getting into the food business. And so I've realized that if I go to like restaurants, not even high end, even middle restaurants that are owned by people who are from outside coming in, they're working so hard to teach their people good customer service or even the owner of the company is there or the restaurant so you feel like it's gradually beginning to improve at certain places so we just have to give credit to that but majority of the time just lower your expectations mm. yes mm, okay so assuming you were given an administrative role here in ghana what three things would you change about the country hey <laughs> hey <laughs> Okay, this is like really controversial opinion, mm -hmm. but I would reduce the number of times you guys go to church and just tell you to work. Perfect. I'm not saying you guys don't work, but like God can only do so much. This girl, I'm say, you're saying, let's pray for it. <laughs> there's, 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 there's debt issue, let's pray for it. There's unemployment, let's pray. Uh -uh. Mm. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Like spirituality should be the foundation of our being but we're overdoing it. And it's not just here, it's in many African countries, like even our president, his wife and the deputy president's wife, they've been doing this prayer rally ever since they got elected. And I'm like, I get it, but um, we have girls who don't have sanitary towels in Kenya. How about you pick up that course and champion for it? We have girls who are getting teenage pregnancy and dropping out of school early. How about you champion for that course? We have young people who are drowning in local alcohol appetishi back in Kenya, how about you take that course and, and set up rehabilitation centers? As Africans, we have really exploited what religion and spirituality was meant to be. I mean, Stacy will correct us if we're wrong, but the white people who bring re brought religion here, they don't even practice it the way we practice That's it. True. That's you true. You know, it's only us that buy factories and turn them into churches. You know, it's only here that we will spend a billion to build a church for unemployed youth to come to the church. Instead of using that money to invest so that these young people can, can get jobs. We have a spectator in our midst. <laughs> so that these young people can get jobs, you know. Uh -huh. And then, I mean, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, right? We can build a small structure. Like, can we turn it into something more meaningful? The, the resources that the churches have, the people that are there, people shouldn't be unemployed. CEOs go to church, MDs go to church, business owners go to church. I'm not saying give these young people jobs, but how many times during a service will they say, all the young people stay back, so-and-so will tell you how to tailor make your CV. So-and-so will tell you, if you've done this course, these are the industries that you should look at. How many times do we do that? You know, and so I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm saying either we turn it to, to, to address the needs that we have as a people or we just minimize it and find ways of addressing our challenges. 
We can pray, Papa. I remember Banky W once said in a long TED talk, he said, if prayers could change things, Nigeria would be the most developed country in the world. That is true because th that Nigeria is the most spiritual country here in Africa. Everybody has a Christian name, whether blessing, promise, <laughs> The Nigerians Glory. will come for you. <laughs> the Nigerians will come for you. So you see, so I wish, I wish we could get there and just say, listen, I love God I lo I, and I'm going to serve him. But in serving God, I don't think you can serve God if you're not serving humanity. That's true. You know, I don't think, and this is a typical example in Kenya, we're giving millions in t of, of money in tithe, right? And people will come to the comment section and ask me, how much did you give? It's okay. People are starving in some parts of the... Like, what's the essence of that community? Like, what's the essence of it? You know? Look at Jews. There's a book called Capitalist Nigger. Mm -hmm. Anybody, if you have time, go and read it. Okay. The way the Jews operate, after the Holocaust, they said, never again. It wasn't just spiritual empowerment. It was economic empowerment. It was political empowerment. Stacey will tell you, say anything anti-semitic right now anti-semitism just just blab one wrong thing you're done you are done because of the influence and the impact they have not just as a as, as as a spiritual group but as a people you understand and so they've empowered themselves so what do we have to show off for our spirituality what do we have to show the jews will tell you a b c and d I read the book a long time ago, so I can't like clearly remember, but I know that they empowered themselves and they fortified themselves in positions of influence, power, and money so that they are never in a compromising situation again. Okay, so that is one. Utilization of resources. Okay. I was reading a paper by Dr. David D. He's a really brilliant economist. And he was like, infrastructure-driven um, investment is not working for Africa. If you look at countries like Bangladesh, they have the infrastructure is not even half compared to what we have in africa but they're the mass producers so whatever infrastructure driven um, investment was supposed to do for us it's not doing instead it's just ballooning and ballooning and ballooning our national debt ghana has recently defaulted kenya is on the red line many african countries are struggling to pay back money because you have this massive infrastructural projects you have big roads leading to nowhere or you have roads that you didn't have a plan with it, and now you have money that you need to pay, and you can't afford to pay it. Yet people like Bangladesh, production. They've gone into production, they're producing, and they're producing 10 times what we are producing with half the infrastructure that we have. So he was saying, can we go back to agricultural-driven economies? Is that for debate? The economists in the comment section can tell us what they think, but we really need to rethink how we are investing our money and also who we are borrowing from. Sorry, I'm getting technical. Like as a business <laughs> analyst, we are borrowing from the wrong people. You can't be borrowing commercial and then increasing taxes, and mm -hmm. then the cost of living is going high on the typical, on the locals, and then they can't afford basic things. You know, so change the dynamics of borrowing and investment. And I think the last thing would be just fire old people from government honestly <laughs> like at, at that, a certain that, age that is an important point. i was even asking my dad how much money is enough money and he said money is never enough as a human being you need to know when to stop and if you can't find that you'll be 70 still holding on to a public office you're being wheeled in there with a wheelchair because you're trying to afford you're going to die how much can you spend in this lifetime you know like how much can you spend so what is this obsession with, with power and fortifying it and keeping a few rich and very many poor? Like, what is, what is it? I admire Scandinavian countries because they, everybody just has enough. All the children go to public schools. Everybody uses public transport. Everybody goes to public health care. And everybody is okay. They are some of the happiest people in the world, most developed countries in the world. That, that's so perfect. I had an opportunity to work um, with a company and what I saw was very disappointing. We had very old men who could barely write. You see, his hand was shaking even when he was writing. With a lot of sheet of paper, like manual data entry, when we have a lot of of the youth specializing in data entry so i really agree with, with yeah 
with the I mean, last point. And, and, really and, like and this is a person who some of these jobs are permanent and pensionable. Hmm. So can, can you, we also need to teach our people the value of rest and living, you know? At, at 60, why are you still struggling with <laughs> government tenders and all that stuff? Go raise your grandchildren. That's the value of life. To be able to live, you know? Because you, some of these people, they have so much money, they can't spend it in this lifetime. And even if they come back in the next, they won't be able to spend all of it. Mm. So what is it that you're chasing? It's not that we are immortal. We will die at some point. You and I don't know when we're going to die. So <laughs> what are true. you chasing? As much as I want this to continue, <laughs> we, we would have to bring it to an end. Oh. So thank you so, so much for being on my channel. Thank you so much for having time for me. I will put your socials up or down in my channel. Yeah. And then you can also introduce yourself to my... Okay, okay. Okay, guys, it was really lovely being here and hanging out with me. Um, you can find me on social media on Dero Ganga and you can find our couple's um, social media, um, Benj and Nori, on Instagram and on TikTok. And we, I also have a YouTube channel where I make um, travel, life and love content. Yeah, so Ondiro Oganga, that's where Ondiro you find me. Ondiro Oganga, that, yes. that, that is a very deep name. What is the meaning of the name? No, one is my dad, one is my uncle. Long story, <laughs> we are always named after people in Kenya. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. We have a similar culture here, so I understand. Yeah, so thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. <laughs>